what we're going to do today, uh, to begin with at least, is the first part of today is, is, is an exercise using what are currently state-of-the-art uh, methods for predicting secondary structure. And these are programs that have been developed in my group now over the last 15, 16 years or so. Um, and they're called JPRED and JNET. And these are extremely widely used. They do predictions for people. They can, you can go to the server that you're going to use from anywhere in the world. It's freely accessible. And they do up to around a quarter of a million predictions a month for people all over the world. So it's very heavily used. It's one of the most heavily accessed sites, certainly in the University of Dundee. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to go through a bit of the kind of background to those, and then you're going to do practical using the latest version of JPRED. And JPRED has this other advantage that it's quite a useful way to get a first pass multiple alignment for your favorite protein as well, because part of what it does is it searches a database and pulls back a bunch of sequences that are similar. Um, so it's, it can be quite a good starting point for looking at your protein family in an easy way. It just pulls this information in that you can look at. And we'll go through the different ways of, of, of using the output from JPRED in Jalview, um, depending on what you're interested in, uh, in looking at. OK, so but before we get on to that, oh, so in the last part, the last thing I'll talk about is subfamily analysis. So we did a little bit of this last week, where you took the immunoglobulin domains and you compared four and four, and you drew a tree, and then you cut the tree, and you saw similarities and differences between the subgroups. And we're going to talk in more detail about that, but in, with reference to a bigger family and, and more of the kind of the background to that and the kinds of things you can discover. And again, like I did with the SH2 domain and secondary structure prediction, I'll talk you through an example where we you know, basically led to the development of the tools that you can now use easily. So this was stuff, again, from the early 90s, um, where we made, we made predictions from sequences about uh, interacting residues based on this kind of subfamily analysis. So that's the last part of the talk. So that, in some ways, I think that's probably the more useful bit, just because this is the kind of thing you can really get a lot out of a multiple alignment by looking at subfamilies and looking at columns and alignments. And it's all useful, of course. OK, so JPR and JNet, well, what are these things? This is where they are. So this, this is the kind of thing we've been dealing with. You've got a protein sequence. You're interested in the three-dimensional structure. This is a simplification of the structure and the function. And this step, the colors are really weird on this projector. It seems to have lost all the colors. These are supposed to be different colors. Um, you can predict alpha helices and beta strands, as we've talked a bit about last week. So it's this step we're going to talk about predicting helices and strands. So there are two things. I said JPRED and JNET. What's the difference between them? JNET is the kind of engine. It's the prediction method that's used on a website called JPRED. JPRED is the website. JNET's the kind of engine that does the predictions. And um, it also, JPRED includes JNET, but it also has some other tools. And it has, has, has things to present the predictions in different ways. So for example, it predicts where coiled coils are using a program called Coils. And it also predicts um, buried and exposed uh, residues. So what's the history of this thing? It goes right back to 1987, which was the first method for predicting secondary structure from multiple sequence alignments. Um, and then the first JPRED was 99. And what that did was something like what I described in the last lecture, where we combined predictions from lots of methods and put them all together. Um, and then version one of JNET was a, this thing called a multiple neural network. And I'm going to explain how that works, because it's good for you. Um, predictor, it replaced all the other methods. And then we've gone through a few refreshes, retraining, improving the method over the, over the years, with the most recent update happening last year. So we're now up to JPRED 4. And it did uh, kind of updates to the prediction engine and all kinds of improvements to the website to make it um, more useful and more 21st century. OK, so what do I mean by new? I mentioned a neural network. What's a neural network? Um, it's a machine learning method. It's not the thing you've got in your head, although you have a neural network in your head as well. Um, but in this context, it's, a, it's called a machine learning. It's a computational. Uh, learning algorithm. And the way it works, what you do is you have, a, you have some data and you have 
this thing, you have the input nodes to the network. And so you have some data that, about your system, and we'll show an example for structure prediction in a moment. And you have some outputs here, and in between you have these nodes, and they're all connected together. And what happens uh, is you present data to the input, and you present the known results on the output, and then you, you train the network by, to optimize um, essentially weights on these links. There's an equation that links every node to every other node, and you're, you're optimizing the, the parameters for that equation across all, all the data input and all the data output. And it learns, the network learns to recognize then other examples are, are of the output that it hasn't seen before. So there's a lot of there's a lot of subtlety in how you do this to do it well and to get good, a good uh, method that will learn and will train, but um, which I'm not going to explain, but uh, you know, there's quite a lot of work goes into doing this well. Um, <clears throat> essentially, um, the quality of a predictor that you get out with a neural network is very dependent on the quality of the data, as with anything. It can only learn from what's there, and it can only uh, learn uh, effectively if you, if you present the right data to it. So what do we do with, with JPRED? Um, JNet, well JNet in fact is 2.3.1. You have to have some training data where you know the answer for secondary structure, and we've got the protein data bank. Um, we take a subset of that based on SCOP, or SCOPE in fact, domains database. So we have to take a set of domains where we know the three-dimensional structure, and then we build multiple alignments from those domains. Um, we know the secondary structure of every residue in each of those domains. So that's our kind of training data. And then to test it, uh, we work from, we train on 1,208 domains, which are distinct in structure. So they're not sequenced similar to each other. So they're diverse across the whole of what's currently known about protein folds. Um, so you develop the method on these, and then you test it once you've developed the method trained it to do as well as possible on this set, uh, you, um, you test it. We test it on, on, a small, on a set that hasn't been used at all in training. Um, it's kind of blind test. So it's a bit like, so you can avoid this kind of um, criticism where you say, well, you knew the answer. You just take a set out that isn't there. You put it to one side. Don't use it in developing the method. And then you test it at the end just on that. You do it once. You do that one test. So it's called a blind test. It's not truly blind because you do know the answer because you do know, but you have to basically convince people you've not cheated and um, we're there. Okay, so this is a kind of standard machine learning approach that we've done for a lot of time and you can use this on other kinds of problems as well. Cross-validation is a process, so with training, what you do is you, you have 1,208 domains, you take one out, or in fact we take a tenth out. Um, you train the method on the remaining nine tenths. You test it on the tenth you took out. Then you take a different tenth out. You train on nine tenths. You test, and you basically that way you're te always testing on things that haven't been used to train it, and you get that to converge. Um, and then you take the results of that and apply it to your blind your set that you weren't used in that cross validation process. So it's a way to try and avoid it being biased towards a certain set of proteins. Um, what do we use in, in JNet? Well, it, um, what we do is we take the sequence and it searches a database. This is Uniprot or Uniref90. Uh, we use Cyblast at the moment. So Cyblast, I've mentioned, I think last week, it is like Blast. It takes a single sequence, searches the database, pulls back a set of sequences, builds a profile. We learned about profiles last week. Searches again with the profile. That will put in more sequences uh, with more specificity, and you iterate around that process um, until you have uh, you know, a, a consistent profile that represents uh, sequences. It gives you a, a set of sequences that align un unambiguously to your query and um, capture the variability at every position in the sequence. <laughs> this approach is, you know, Cyblast is one of a family of programs that do this kind of thing. Um, and it's the one we use currently in, in, in JPREP. So it builds profiles. Uh, we also take the output of Cyblast and create a thing called a hidden Markov model. I think I may have mentioned this last week. It's another way of, it's another way of describing a sequence alignment 
um, it's got a, a, a slightly more uh, rigorous statistical uh, framework that it works in than uh, these things called position-specific scoring matrices or, or profiles. Um, early versions had a lot more inputs. We did a lot more things. But basically, you present a neural network with these two things. And what is it? So for example, I've, I've told you the profiles, we showed this figure before. They're important because they emphasize <laughs> the position-specific features which amino acids are preferred at a particular location. Uh, they help to identify these patterns. You know, they start to appear in this profile, um, the kind of patterns that we identified by eye in those multiple alignments last week. So it's kind of capturing that information in a profile. Okay, uh, what are the outputs? Well, there's a program called DSSP that will take a three-dimensional structure of a protein and define where all the helices and strands are. It actually defines eight different secondary structure states because yeah, it defines alpha helix, parallel and anti-parallel beta strand. It, just, it, it defines 310 helix, pi helix, and some, some kinds of turns and bends and a few other features. And in fact, the way what most people do with secondary structure prediction is they reduce that eight state down to three because the eight states are, are less useful from a prediction point of view and actually quite hard. You don't get enough data on every state to be able to define, to predict it reliably. So we have these three states, helix, E or B for extended. E is what we use, the letter E for extended, that's beta strand, and everything else is a separate state. So we have three basically different secondary structure types that we predict. And how does it work? Well, it takes a multiple alignment like this, or a profile. Um, the profile for this, read, this window that we're looking at here is, is shown here. It's a, um, at every, every, um, um, every position in this um, window, you have a profile that represents, it's actually not this long, it's actually 400 numbers long because you have to represent every amino acid at every position. But the numbers in here come from the position specific scoring matrix from the profile that I showed you before. They come out of that. They're log based uh, numbers. So you end up with a very long vector of numbers for every amino acid position in the, in the column in the alignment. On the output you have three numbers. So this is on the input you have 400 numbers. On the output you have three numbers, one for each secondary structure state and it's either a 1 or a 0, depending upon whether it's there or not. So here it's a, a dash, which is a, um, a coil. It's a not a helix or a strand, so it's a 1 in the first column. As we move along, the numbers change, we move along a bit more. Now here we've got an H, which is the first position in the helix. So it's the middle residue in this window that we're looking at, and that's, that's a, that, that scores a 1. So this is what we're giving to this neural network. On its input, you give it this big long vector of numbers. And on the output, you're giving it three numbers, zero, zero, or one. Okay, so you've got this, so you have, in fact, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. So you have this idea of a, a sequence, an amino acid sequence to a secondary structure network prediction. And as I say, there's hundreds of inputs here. There's not just, uh, Five, there's 400 or even more. Um, the output of that we actually feed into another network that takes the secondary structure on the input and secondary structure on the output. And the reason for doing that is what tends to happen with the predictions here is you get, you can get quite an accurate prediction, but it doesn't look very protein-like. So it might might have gaps in the middle of a helix. It might predict, you know, might go hel helix coil, helix coil, a long sequence. It can be some slightly strange things happen and what this network does is it kind of cleans that up and you end up with things that look more helix like yeah, here's an example so you got this HHH and then a coil HHH coil so this isn't very realistic as a real alpha helix but when you put it through the second network it cleans it up and you get a nice helix like thing so this is a trick that was first first developed by uh, Berkhard Rost and Chris Sander in the early 90s for secondary structure prediction and we, we, we adopted it as well so you need training data. I said we use a set of PDB domains and known structure from the SCOP database. Um, this is an old slide, actually. This was, that's a, oh, that's a bigger number. Oh, the numbers have changed on this slide. That's kind of strange. Uh, anyway, it's 150 domains. Um, as I said, we do um, cross-validation, k-fold, actually we do 10-way 
cost validation. Oh, this is just to explain what that means. So if we have all of our examples here, we divide it into one, two, three, four, five, six. In this case, there's seven, sevenfold. You take one out, train the network on these. You predict on this one, train, test, then you do it again and again and again. And um, in fact, uh, this is version one of JNet, but essentially you have a bunch of different neural networks with data presented in different ways to them. You then combine it and come up with the final prediction, which is why, as you see, when you look at when you look at the output of JNet, when you get to look at that or JPred, you'll see there's multiple lines in the output for predictions because it shows you everything, even though you most of the time you just take the the consensus prediction. It's useful to see the other lines because they can show you where there's ambiguity. So this is, this is an old slide. This is going back, I think, to 2000, but it shows you how um, the, you know, this combining different kinds of data, um, although you're using exactly the same training data, you're presenting it in different ways to a neural network. And when you combine it, you end up improving the accuracy um, overall uh, to, in that case, what was a world beating like 77%, 76.9% accuracy. Um, okay. So blind test, again, this is comparing different predictions. So ZPred, this is the one that I mentioned, the first method for predicting from multiple alignment, dating from 1987. And then a bunch of other methods that all predict from multiple sequence alignments up to the first JNet, which was naturally doing better. This is, this is a way of representing, this is a box plot representing the median accuracy across all the testing data. Uh, the box contains 75% of the proteins and the whiskers contain, sorry, the box contains 25% and the whiskers contain 75%. So that was in 2000. What's happened since? So you're not using the 2000 program, you're using the one from 2015. What's happened since then? Um, as I say, the overall accuracy back then was uh, around just, you know, around below 80% and you're just below 80%, 76.4%. Uh, what's happened since? Well, this is the curve. So what you see is as the years have gone on, and here on this plot I'm putting the prediction accuracy against the year, and we've got JPRED, which is our method, in, in the blue diamonds. SIPRED, which is the other method that is most widely used for secondary structure prediction. And I think if you're interested in predicting structures of proteins, use them both. I'd recommend using both. SIPRED is developed by David Jones. Um, he has a very, very nice suite of tools for predicting secondary structure based in, at University College London. Um, he covers transmembrane helix prediction, um, topology prediction of transmembrane helices, contact prediction in proteins, which is something I've not really talked about, but he has a big suite uh, of tools. So his, his sites were well worth going to and, and, and looking at for these tools. Um, our, our predictor is at the moment slightly better than his. Um, but really there's not a lot in it, so it's worth running them both. You know, one will maybe so slightly different secondary structure prediction to the other one, and you can decide which one you like. Unfortunately, at the moment you can't run SciPred from within Jalview, but you can run it separately and then import it onto Jalview. Predict Protein is another predictor. This was developed by Burkhard Ross Lab. Um, it's difficult to get accuracy values for this because they don't really publish them so, so openly. Um, but they're based in New York at the moment, or it's actually you know, now in Germany again. He's moved back to Germany. Um, okay, so the, the point here is that the, um, oops, the accuracy uh, is, is rising but flattening out. So we're kind of flattening out just above 80% overall across all proteins. So what that means, what does that mean? It means for some proteins, the accuracy is lower than that, and for quite a lot, it's higher. So for, depending on the protein, and one of the things you're going to do is look at some examples of this. Um, in fact, the training data we used for uh, and the testing data, the blind test data for for, um, for JPRED, and you'll see you'll see that the range in accuracy of predictions uh, that you get. So that, there's a big table you'll be looking at in one of the practicals that does this. Um, it's part of, I won't I won't prejudge the results because there's some questions I want you to try and think about when you look at that data. <coughs> well, I want you to think about them. You won't try. You'll, you will think about them. Um, okay, so 
And the other thing you get out of these methods is a measure of, of confidence in the prediction. So it's fine to say, well, our method is like 80% accurate. But what you're interested in when you run it for real is which parts of the prediction are more reliable than other parts. Now, from your experience from last week's lectures, you've got, got an idea of some of the things you can do to try and reassure yourself that a prediction is reliable by looking at the patterns yourself in the sequence. So if you see a very strong pattern that looks like a, an alternating hydrophobic and the method's telling you it's a beta strand, you can probably believe it. Of course, if it's a little short run of hydrophobics and uh, it's telling you it's a beta strand, you have to think, hmm. <laughs> as I showed you at the end last week. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. But what uh, JNET gives you and, um, is, is an also a measure of confidence in each, each position that's predicted. And it's a scale from zero to nine. So it will say, I'm confident, I'm more or less confident in this prediction, at this position. Um, and that, that's pretty reliable. So what this, what this plot, this complicated plot, is showing two things. On one, on here, we're looking at the confidence value, which, as I say, runs from well, 0 to 10. It's actually 0 to 9. Um, and on this axis, we've got the coverage. So how many amino acids in all the proteins we've looked at are actually um, predicted at that level of confidence? So if you say um, you require um, a level of confidence of at least zero, we predict 100% of the, of the residues with at least zero confidence, at least zero. But if we require a confidence value of nine, we're only predicting down around 20% of the positions with high confidence. So it gives you an idea. You can look at the confidence. You can say, well, you know, <coughs> for 20% for 20 of the pro protein, we're very high, very confident in the prediction. Uh, we're getting. Um, and you can, you can take a value, you know, maybe, maybe around six, around six, seven, you're, you're, you're at a level of, you know, um, uh, you're covering around 60, 70 percent of the protein um, with high confidence, you know, with, with a more moderate confidence. That translates into an accuracy of, you know, seven, around 70 percent, something like that. So it gives you a, a, a way, this plot gives you a way of seeing, you know, um, where that confidence, how, how useful that confidence is in interpreting the predictions you get. This is just comparison of two versions of JNET, the, the original version uh, in the black triangles and, and the later version, uh, version 2, not the very latest version, um, which is, you know, shows an improvement in both of those values, which is good. You like to see improvements. The latest JNET has made a, a less dramatic improvement. I'm not going to talk, you know, the, the accuracy has gone up a little bit and the confidence has gone up a little bit. But it's not as, quite as dramatic as it was um, back in the day, back in the last uh, version. Okay, so I'm going to introduce a practical now.